All right, good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well today. And um, hope you're just uh, keeping in the love of God and keeping the faith. Uh, we are moving forward in Jesus' name and are uh, getting back to somewhat normal life, hopefully soon, and church is opening up somewhat soon. And so if you haven't checked out any of that information, please get to our webpage and just dig de a little deeper on our Facebook page about how we're opening up here in the next coming weeks. And so we're just excited to see some more people as we come in to the house of the Lord. And uh, I believe we're going to be in for a good time. Amen. Amen. It's going to be great. So uh, this morning, I just wanted to share a little bit about um, from Revelation chapter 7. I was just reading it this morning and uh, just in my own devotional time. I've kind of taken my time over the last number of weeks just slowly going through Revelation and reading some commentary on it and just allowing it to get into me. And, uh, and so today I'm just going to read this out a little bit, so just uh, stick with me, hang with me as we read, and I believe it'll be an encouragement to us here this morning. So Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 1, uh, he's, John says this, he says, after, I, uh, after this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. And then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. You can see there's an element of, of restraining, of holding back this judgment to come upon the earth until God's servants had a seal placed upon them. And then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Uh, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Simeon, 12,000. Levi, 12,000. Uh, Issachar, 12,000. And Zebulun, 12,000. And Joseph, 12,000. And Benjamin, 12,000. I'm, I'm going quicker here. You get the point, right? 12,000 for all the tribes of Israel. Verse 9, and after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels standing around the throne uh, and around the elders and the four living creatures, so they, they were standing around the throne, along with all the elders and four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, They are the ones who've come out of the great tribulation. They have washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in, uh, in his, and in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence, and never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. Um, he goes on to say they will dry every tear from their eye. It's just a beautiful, um, oh, there it is. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, it says, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Powerful scripture, right? I mean, this, what, what a, a great hope that we really have. And uh, just a couple of things that I wanted to bring out in the scripture here this morning, and simply, and I alluded to it when we were reading it, uh, is that really the Spirit of God is actually restraining evil on the earth as it is. Now, we were it's funny, we were talking about this, me and Pastor Odette, last week a little bit. And as much as we see things that are just going crazy here on the earth, like we see the effects of evil, we see people doing evil deeds, and we see, and we know certainly throughout history, uh, extreme examples of evil on the earth, right? I mean, we all know this, and we see elements of it today, and evil is really insidious, deceptive, and destructive, and and we know this is true, and yet the reality is there's a sense on the earth of the Holy Spirit is really present over all the earth. I mean, he's in each one of us as believers. We carry the presence of God, and there's Christians all over the earth, we know. And so there's a sense of the Holy Spirit is actually over all the earth, and because of that, there is actually a measure of holding back evil to its totality. We see this in 2 
Thessalonians where it's talking about the man of lawlessness, right? He says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And so basically talking about in end times that God will remove the restraints. He's, there's a doctrine called, um, and we, we learned this in Bible school when I was there 100 years ago, that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. He is restraining the full force of evil. Uh, and thank you, Lord, for that. You know what I mean? Like, like, we live in, in the benefit of that. But there will come a time, according to 2 Thessalonians, that he will move out of the way and allow evil to have its reign on the earth. And we see through all of the end time scriptures. And uh, of course, so really the reality is here in Canada, no matter what we see instances of evil, instances of wrong, um, we certainly enjoy a great measure of peace and prosperity here in Canada. Uh, but it will not be forever. Um, it, it will get worse. To what I mean, hopefully, we, we need to work towards peace. Scripture says that, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. We work towards it, but we all know that as the end times come, things are going to get a little bit worse. They're going to get nastier. And at some point, God is going to remove his spirit. And so that sounds very ominous. That sounds very, uh, not, that's a very encouraging message, Pastor Darren. Where are you going with this? Now, here's the good news, all right? We read in verse 3 to 8 that we are actually protected from the full force of this. Um, it says that the, belief, that the Holy Spirit is actually waiting for all of God's people to be sealed, it says. There's, you know, his servants will be sealed before the full breadth of all of this happens. Now, um, many people have different beliefs on the Great Tribulation and the rapture of the church. There's a lot of different scriptures, uh, and we can argue on certain points. Um, but the reality is, at the end of it all, when we read through these things, we know that the church of Christ is in good hands. Amen? We're in good hands. We have nothing to fear because it says that God's people will be sealed. We will be in his presence. We will be with him. He will look after us. Uh, the the 144,000 mentioned here in Revelation 7, of course, for those of us who have been in church for a while, it's, it's, a, it's a topic of much debate over the years, and lots of people interpret this differently. Um, there's different theories on that. And even within the evangelical church, even within Pentecostalism or, or the Baptist church, or you name it, there's differences of opinion, even within denominations on this. And so I don't know if we all have, or if any one of us has the exact idea of what this is. The way I look at it, though, and from my study, and uh, uh, I kind of lead towards the thought that these two groups are really the same group. That is the 144,000. And then later on in verse 9, it says the great multitude was before the throne, that no one could count from every tribe, nation, and language. You had the 144,000, and then the great multitude that no one could count was around the throne of God. And so... What is this 144,000? Well, really, it's symbolic. That's clear, okay? We have to understand that. This is not a literal 12,000 from each tribe, per se, okay? It's symbolic. In the scripture, the number 12 is actually seen in many places uh, and having the symbolism that has to do with authority or perfection of authority in leadership or in government, okay? And we see this throughout the scriptures. Uh, and so it's a symbolic thing, and so I kind of lean towards the idea of, now again, you might differ on this, that's okay, um, that these two groups are really the same thing. Now, my old pastor in Red Deer, Paul Valley, he wrote a book on Revelation, and he says this about that. He says, and I, I, I kind of lean towards this too. He says, it seems to me that the 144,000 and the great multitude are the same group, and the author is restating to make a point. He is showing that both groups, Old Covenant and New Covenant people, are part of God's overall people. Basically saying that, look, if whether you're from, you know, old or new, we are all in Christ. We are all one. And then it says these people are to be sealed. It means, again, they're protected. Now, we see many instances in Scripture where the seal of God was placed upon households, right? We think of Exodus. You know, Exodus chapter 12 and the Passover. These people were protected from the great judgment. They were they were passed over with the calamity, passed over with the great tribulation that was to come. Uh, we see it in other areas of Scripture as well. And so, so the good news is this. When we think of how crazy the world is, how we know that scripturally things will at some point get worse. But as believers, we have this hope that we are um, in God's hands. Amen? That we don't have to worry. We don't have to sweat it. Um, my old Bible school professor, you know, uh, Dr. Gordon Franklin, you know, great man of God, great, you know, highly educated, of course, but 
uh, when we were taking these eschatology classes, he would say, you know, the, the whole, I've said this before, and I apologize because I repeat myself, but, um, you know, some people are, are the pre-trib people. They believe we're going to be raptured before the tribulation. Some are mid-trib, some are post-trib, and they all have different points of scripture and arguments to say why, that, why they believe that. And he goes, personally, I'm pan-trib, you know. It's all going to pan out in the end, so I'm not going to sweat about it too much, but I'm going to, I'm going to be in Christ today because if I am, I know that I don't have to worry about all this, right? And, uh, and really, that's the heart, I believe, of revelation and the heart of, of what God wants for us, that we are in him. And so lastly, my last point, so just talking about again, that uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is really restraining evil on the earth. Secondly, we are protected from what's to come. And then lastly, uh, simply our glorious hope, which we've been talking about again. And in verse 16, it says, never again will they hunger. This is good news, friends, right? Never again will they hunger, nor will they thirst. The sun will not be down on them, nor any scorching heat for the lamb. At the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And so um, put your hope in heaven. Put your hope in, in Christ, because we are just sojourners here on this earth. We are just passers-by. All of the stuff that we deal with today, all of the injustice, all of the evil, all of the things that put stress or anxiety within us, this is going to be gone like this. And we have an eternity uh, that awaits us in heaven, and it's a glorious eternity. It is amazing. The Apostle Paul said that I consider my present sufferings nothing in compared to the glorious hope that what God has put before me. So you know what? We, we have to keep our eyes where they need to be on heaven. And so that's just my thought for this morning, just reading through Revelation. So I'm going to pray and uh, I pray that God would just strengthen you in that today. And so in the room, I don't know if there's any prayer requests that uh, we need to lift up before God yeah, today. Yeah. It's an unspoken request. Yeah. Of, uh, marriage trouble and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Pray for some marriages, some unspoken things here. Yeah. I'm going to pray that the God blesses him, God will fix him, and we don't have a problem. Okay. Sure. I'll pray for that. Anything else? Well, the continued, you know, just, um, I don't want to call it riots, but the continued protests of people, um, that governments and people in place of power uh, would know what, how to discern this whole situation and sure. what to do for the good of, you know, just not certain groups, but the good of all. Right. That we come to some balance here and we get back to focusing on what's good for our country. Amen. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to pray. So, Heavenly Father, we just uh, look to you today. God, it doesn't take us very long, or we don't have to look very far to see unrest in our world, to see stress and turmoil, conflict, anxiety as individuals and also uh, regions, cities, states, provinces. God, we see the effect really on the earth, and I would suggest of the evil one who wants to disrupt, who wants to divide, who wants to devour, really. But God, today we recognize that our hope is in you. Lord, I pray today that believers would not get caught up in worldly systems and worldly thoughts, but God, our eyes would be focused on you. That we would have eyes to discern, Lord, what's really happening, not just in the flesh and blood, but Lord, we know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But Lord, there's powers and principalities behind the scenes that are often at work and we don't even realize it. So God, I pray that we would exa be examples of love, of light, of wisdom, um, examples of you, Jesus, of your mercy, of your compassion, of your grace. And so Lord, certainly uh, we do pray um, and for these needs here today, for Carla's friend who's uh, needing a job and just wondering what, how that's going to work out. God, we pray that you would provide that right opportunity, that right job uh, for her friend today. Um, missing a prayer. Oh, the marriages. God, that Pastor Bev was talking about the marriages that is coming even into her uh, conversations and the struggles and some unspoken needs in these things. God, that you would just intervene in these marriages. God, that you would, uh, by your spirit, draw them close to you and then to one another. God, we don't know the circumstances, and sometimes things happen in our relationships, and, and things in our past bubble up, and it affects our current relationships, and 
Sometimes it can get complicated and messy, but God, I, I know that you are able to redeem all things, that your grace covers all things. And so God, I pray that you would work on these people's hearts and lives today. Um, God, you love them and fill them with your love so that they can love others and love one another in the way that you love us. And so uh, we pray for that today in Jesus. Yeah, for, for all of the, the leaders who are overseeing in places of unrest, places where there's uh, these mass protests and in some places violence and um, and some places are doing it peacefully. And even in those places, God, we pray for leaders of these areas to have the wisdom of God, to know how to govern all these people, to know uh, what changes might need to take place in order to bring forth, as Pastor Bev said, the good for everybody, no matter who they are. But Lord, we just pray for divine, godly wisdom uh, for all of these leaders, Lord, for mayors, city councilors, for governors, for premiers, Lord, for, for whoever's in positions of power, Lord, because we know, again, that the enemy would want to divide, would want to dis, uh, disrupt, Lord, things so much that it puts people against one another. God, we pray for unity, Lord, uh, in our land today, unity, uh, because we know that's where there's blessing, that's where there's favor. And so, God, I just pray for that today. Um, and, Lord, we, we know that only you can bring these things in the way they need to happen. Man's best attempt at unity, Lord, will always fall short. So God, we look to you and we ask, Lord, that you would pour out your answers, your spirit, your presence, your truth in each of these situations. So God, we thank you for this today and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you today. Thanks for tuning in and uh, we hope to see you in person real soon. All right.